The following interview was conducted with Joel Zerati, Zerat, uh for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, July 24, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Joel. Thank, Thank you. you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born, your siblings, and early, early years. I was born in uh, Farr, Texas back in 1954. I was born raised there up until when I was 18 that uh, I came to the Lafayette area, went to school, uh, or first started school here in 1972. At Purdue. At Can Purdue you tell us about uh, high school and grade school a little bit back there? And do you have uh, any siblings? Yes, uh, there's 10 of us in my family as far as grade school. Um, I was pretty, pretty nondescript. I mean, uh, and, and you spent, was it near where you lived? Was yes, okay. uh, yeah, because as a matter of fact, uh, grade school, um, we used to walk uh, well, to school. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, uh, up until the time I went to high school, uh, we walked to, to all schools so okay. to, within the same general, general yeah. area. Right. Tell us a little bit about high school. Were there any activities that uh, you participated uh, in uh, at the all? Main, the main thing that uh, I participated was the, the scholastics. Um, Good. Uh, so... Did they have some? Did they have basketball or football? Yes, they had basketball, football, <laughs> but the sports. But I was never really athletic uh, to participate in those. And sure. So but you were a participant, you uh, a visitor. You go to the games and things like that. Um, of, yes, so, primarily. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then tell us about how did you happen to come to Lafayette, and then tell us about per you went to Purdue. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, no, I think uh, back in my junior year in high school, um, I. I always had this notion for a travel adventure. I read this book. Uh, uh, this, uh, the Arthur was a uh, captain for American Air or Pan American Airlines, which is no longer in existence. But um, uh, he talked about uh, traveling all over the place, and I thought that would be a neat, uh, a neat way to see the world. Uh, he recommended um, Purdue University as far as the aviation program at Purdue University and at Auburn in uh, Alabama. And I remember riding off to both the schools, uh, Purdue and Auburn, and uh, I never did hear back from uh, uh, Auburn, but I was, um, the letter I got uh, from the admissions back then, I remember her, uh, Patricia Moore. Um, I recognize the name, okay. yeah. And it was very nice, so I was really impressed, so uh, this is how I ended up here. Okay. Did you did you live on campus when you were here? Yes, I did. I lived at uh, Cary Quad, and uh, that was quite an experience. First time away from home, so far away from home. Uh, uh, but uh, especially now, I, in contrast, because uh, we do the move in uh, every every year, I remember coming up here with one suitcase and and to see some of these kids uh, move into the residence halls with. Uh, Lots of stuff, uh, color TV, stereos, computers, and right. just amazing. I know, right. What was the campus? Did you? What was your major in then when you came? At that time, um, I was major. Uh, well, I signed up for uh, aeronautical engineering because I was one of the flies. So I thought that might uh, there was a close uh, relationship between uh, flying and um, yeah, and space. Or, yeah. But uh, my first semester... Uh, yeah, the engineering courses were pretty hard, very tough. So that's when I found out about the aviation program. So I switched over to the School of Aviation and um, stuck it out for okay. four years and okay. got my degree. And and then I um, had a friend, um, I don't remember my sophomore year, he had signed up for the Marine Corps program, the flight adoption he talked me into it, and I thought that would be an excellent opportunity for me to go in uh, and get my flight experience. So uh, after I graduated uh, back in 76, uh, I went into the Marine Corps. And okay. How long were you in, and what, what time was about that? Uh, I originally had signed up for six years, and then they had a uh, program, because back then, that was back in 76, uh, the Cold War. Um, they were letting people out of their obligations, so I had not completed my flight program, so they had gave me an option to reduce the um, my obligated time to, from six years to four years, so I went ahead and did that. And, okay. But I it was really a wonderful experience, and I often tell people that um, uh, 
and, and for a wonderful experience for me because um, I had an opportunity to go uh, literally all over the world and do a lot of things that um, I would have not normally have done. And that's why I often recommend to people, especially if they're at a point in their lives to where they're not really sure what they want to do, um, the military is an excellent way to um, get a lot of um, get exposed to a lot right. of things that you normally wouldn't in uh, civilian life. Right. Was there any specific place that uh, you spent any particular amount of time, or? Well, most most of my duty stations were out on the uh, East Coast, um, okay. Cherry Point, North Carolina. But uh, like I said, uh, my last uh, tour of duty was assigned to um, a uh, air refueling uh, squadron. And we got to fly all over the place. Oh, doing that, right? Okay. Yes. Oh. Then what? What came next? After well, then after that, that um, at, uh, after that, um, um, I decided that the military was not the best. Uh, it was to my liking, so I decided to get out, uh, and I ended up um, working for John Deere uh, out of Waterloo, Iowa. Uh, as a production supervisor out there. Mm -hmm. I had often, well, I had heard a lot of wonderful things about John Deere, that uh, they were in the top 5% of this uh, companies to work for back then. So I was really elated when they called me. They got an interview, got selected, and I moved out to Waterloo, Iowa. I wasn't really quite prepared for being out there in the middle of cornfields, but um, I overcame that. So. <laughs> right. And then uh, after uh, John Deere, I got laid off back in 84. I ended up at um, working for um, Pepsi-Cola downtown Detroit. Uh, I was there for about four months, and so I decided that uh, that was not the environment for me. So um, from there, I moved down to back down to Texas. Uh, ended up working for the city of San Antonio as a facility manager. I was there for about five years. Um, I started working on my MBA uh, on the weekend, and that wasn't working out too hot. Uh, cause what, through what? Through uh, the, the school? The yeah. University of uh, St. Mary's of the Lake uh, in oh. San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Yeah. And so I always had this notion that if I was going to go back to, to school, I wanted to be able to do it full-time so this way I wouldn't have to... Go back and forth between school and work, and I wasn't getting what I thought I should be getting out of a master's program. So, my friend uh, Greg Barnes um, was the department head of school of technology, a um, no school of supervision at that time in the school of technology, uh, and he had offered um, me an assistantship uh, if I wanted to do that. So, I figured. Um, I couldn't pass up the opportunity, so that's when I came back in um, '89 and to do my master's in uh, uh, industrial technology. I was here for a year. I did um, 36 hours in one academic year. Graduated uh, in December of '89. Um, I went down back to Texas to work for. Um, Took a couple of jobs there. I worked for uh, Linux uh, out of Fort Worth, Texas, and I was there four months. And uh, they were going under, so I decided to get out. Then I ended up working for as the um, city administrator for my hometown, Far Texas. Uh, but the Texas politics was just too overwhelming uh, that I decided uh, I, yeah, one thing led to another. Um, Ended up coming back here in 91 and back to Purdue University. I've been here ever since. Okay. Can you tell us a little about your, the position that you have, you currently have? I am the uh, refuse and recycling coordinator. I've been trying to, we've been trying, well, and, and that has evolved over the years from recycling to what we're dealing with now as far as more sustainability, looking at uh, broader sure. uh, aspects of uh, being more sustainable doing more for the environment and trying to move the university forward uh, from along, that along those lines. More mm -hmm. of a stewardship concept, uh, yeah, more along the, the concept of storage, being good stewards for the earth and, and promoting that uh, among not only the staff but our, our students. Right, that's right. 
Now I want to talk a little bit about the Latino Cultural Center. Tell us your, about your affiliation and a little bit about that. Back in, uh, oh, and I'm trying to remember, back, um, well, even, even when the first time I came out of here, back in 72, there was nothing really in place for the university uh, or in the university for uh, Latinos and I always found it appalling because uh, there was never, like I said, uh, nothing to promote or to help or uh, with the simulation uh, anybody from the Latino culture. And the same thing uh, back in uh, 89 when I came back to do my master's, uh, there's still uh, nothing had been done in that aspect of it. So, um, back in 02, um, I, I was, um, got involved with uh, one of the Latino uh, organizations, um, I don't remember, um, but anyway, they were very active uh, in trying to move this thing, moving the uh, idea of the, creating a Latino center forward. Um, I worked with those two group of students there, Hansel uh, Moran, and was the, was the president of the uh, Latino Union. I think that's what I call the Latino Union. Um, was very active in trying to promote the idea of a Latino center. Uh, so I got involved with the group and trying to move that forward. In um, O2 was uh, well, Sally uh, Mason was the provost uh, out here. And she was very supportive of uh, that and uh, was very instrumental in um, uh, making it possible and, and, and moving and, and providing the funding, the, providing the more importantly, providing the funding to make it possible, uh, creating a position which eventually led to uh, Maricela uh, Alvarado being hired as the first director for the Latino Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, then as far as moving in, uh, to the original building, and and again, the building. We so, soon uh, outgrew the building, and trying to get the provost uh, to continue supporting it, to where we were able to get a bigger building, larger building to accommodate the uh, the large uh, Latino population that we have here. Because at that time, we were trying to promote, um, as far as uh, the, the center, to support not only the Latino students but the Latinos in the uh, Purdue community. Okay. What were some of the things that they did? Did you, was there an outreach thing that you sort of started at the same time to, for the community that they'd be aware of the center being here? We try to publicize it as much as uh, possible uh, as a source, as a, as a um, resource uh, center. Sure. And to, uh, I remember one of the things that really got, um, or, or really impressed me was that uh, I was talking to a parent and uh, he was, well, he had brought because the center was open for uh, uh, for visitors to come in, and um, he said, "You know, uh, we've never really talked about the Latino roots, um, and he wanted his children. Um, he really appreciated the center being here because he wanted his children uh, to understand uh, the, their Latino roots and where we come from, and uh, that." Um, or at least just being able to understand that aspect of it, right? And, and having and a resource, to right? It. And having a resource to be able to, to be able to find that information and uh, to where they could be proud of their sure. their Latino heritage. And right. Um, how was how did they go about for the facility, the original one? For the researchers, tell where you originally were located. Did you have to look around, or how? Did they well, work? at that time we were. Uh, Probably just met maybe in the steward or right. That was the only thing that was available uh, within the queue. Uh, well, within the time frame that we were looking for, um, and that was the original building was located at 600 uh, South Harrison, um, and yet yeah, we at that time we were just delayed to at least ask something. Sure, right. Um, or you could at least have a gathering space. Right. And that was the main thing because, uh, I mean, we weren't too crazy about the location because that was not in the mainstream. Uh, we had looked at uh, some of the other Latino centers um, at the University of Illinois. Uh, oh, did you do some looking? Yes. Oh, good. Well, tell us a little about no, we, visits. Uh, we had visited um, uh, Bloomington, at the Latino Center in Bloomington, uh, the Latino Center at the University of Illinois. We had uh, done some web research 
on some of the other Latino centers in uh, Michigan and uh, University, uh, well, California, a lot of universities in California. And I remember at that time, the, um, the president of the university was talking about the preeminence and taking the university to a preeminence. Uh, and how we thought it was rather appalling that uh, here we were the only university in the Big Ten that did not have a Latino center. And, you know, we we're supposed to be preeminent. Um, how could we not have a center? Sure. So, Were some of these centers that you visited had been in operation for yes, a period of time? Yes, okay. that, that was the other thing was, that I found appalling, that we found appalling, because not only myself, but as far as the students, because a lot of these univer uh, a lot of these universities have had uh, these Latino centers for over thirty some odd years. That's interesting. And yes, yeah. and uh, here we're supposed to be a progressive university, but uh, yet uh, nobody has been had been willing uh, to push uh, to put this on the forefront and to make it happen. So mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to make sure that um, it it happened. And I remember back um, in know two or three or. I think um, uh, we were uh, we had um, 03 um, we had a dedication uh, right before uh, well when we got the building the one down there on South Campus yeah the one on South Campus um, we had a dedication for the building uh, and at that time Sally Mason the provost came down and spoke and made a commitment to hire the director because at that time um, we had just gotten a building. We had not, um, I think, what was appalling at that time, uh, we got like $5,000 to start up for buy furniture. I'm going, what are you going to do with $5,000? But the thing that impressed me was uh, the students that were involved with them. They were really committed, dedicated. Um, uh, they uh, signed up to staff the, um, the center and... Uh, and at the very least, uh, to keep the place open sure. to where and do uh, some pro get some right, programs going, get some programs, and then um, uh, shortly thereafter, um, uh, they were uh, they allocated some funding to hire full time uh, uh, sec or f full time personnel. Right. Uh, Jesse Snauza right. uh, was right. the, um, the first time uh, full time first full time paid employee there. And that really helped a lot uh, as far as keeping the place open and uh, uh, being able to make uh, just keep things going and at least have somebody to answer the phone, be able to answer questions and right. that kind of stuff. Did the students, did, they have, did you have people, you, uh, was it a committee that was involved in getting the center going? Yes, it and was primarily, like I said. Um, yeah, but mostly yeah, students, but you had to yeah. do a proposal? Did you have to submit a proposal? or? Uh, well, right? the student group, um, the union, uh, I'm trying to remember what was the name of the student uh, union group uh, that was the primarily the spearheaded because we were trying to get um, at that time we were trying to get staff and faculty involved with the uh, proposal but we we had a hard time getting the faculty on board the you know well and of course there was very little few Latino faculty and of course the staff um, uh, we couldn't get uh, so it was primarily the uh, efforts of the student groups, sure. uh, the, the one student group, to, they made it happen. Because I basically, they would come to me and say, uh, what do you think we should do? And I said, <laughs> rather than waiting for the faculty to get on board or the staff to get on board, uh, we need to seize the moment and make it happen. Otherwise, at that time, it was the spring, uh, it was in the spring, school was going to be out in the in a, a <laughs> few weeks. So we said, uh, we decided, you know, we need to go for it. and get a commitment from the provost uh, and make it happen, otherwise it's not going to happen. Because that was the last year uh, Hansel was going to graduate that year, and I said, you know, we have the momentum, we need to go, we need right. to make it happen, otherwise uh, we're going to lose right. it. And Did Margaret, was Professor Rao involved with it, Margaret, Rao, Margaret Professor Rao? Uh, Rao, yes, Rao. Prof and, and uh, she was also very instrumental in, uh, in moving this forward, because uh, Peggy, uh, through Peggy's efforts, um, right. uh, funding was made available uh, to hire uh, the full, first full-time. Sure. Uh, and she was also the advisor. She met with uh, the group. There's a group of us. Um, uh, she met with us to uh, try to guide us through and as far as and can basically right. support support the initiative and right. continue with, uh, once the building was in place, to continue with the growth and 
because uh, the next step was the, the hire full time. Sure. Were you involved director. with the search with that? Yes. Oh, we were. okay. I was. Um, yeah, this, I couldn't believe that uh, they actually when they actually announced that they were going to do a search. Uh, you know, we got uh, some faculty, some myself, and uh, some of the student group. Uh, some of the students uh, were involved uh, in in the search committee to. To look through all the resumes and try to figure out uh, who would be the best person to to lead the initiative, uh, continue right. with the, right. what we had started. And yeah, it's good. And how did you get then after she came? Is it was it after Marcella, came, the current director, that you got the new facility, or did you had you had this one before she came? No, um, okay. we had the uh, after uh, Maricela was hired. Uh, she continued uh, as far as just putting the program together and sure. expanding the program and uh, eventually, uh, like, as I mentioned, the, the needs of the Latino community here were a lot bigger than what the, what the fi uh, facility, the, uh, the building right. on South Campus could provide. So this is where she um, uh, was instrumental. And, and, and like I said, at that time, um, uh, Provost uh, Mason was still here so she was still very well, uh, yeah, Mason and uh, Peggy, as I'm trying to remember, uh, Peggy was the uh, assistant provost. Uh, she was still very yeah, supportive of, um, of, uh, of the center, sure. and um, especially from a financial aspect of it, to make sure that it continued to grow, or at least uh, had the, um, the resources to be yeah. able to offer more and, yeah. and be a, a be able to uh, have the resources to fulfill its mission of being a resource to the Latino community. Sure. Are you still connected with you involved with it? Yes. With the yeah. students? That's good. The um, artifacts that you have in there for the researchers, they're uh, particularly in the mantle, they're lovely. Were those given as gifts? You have some, you had some, uh, when we did the interview, we've interviewed the director, we saw some artifacts on the mantle there. At, uh, those have come from uh, uh, They're different, very nice. Right. They've come from different students, but uh, the one that's especially dear to me is uh, a dress uh, of my daughter uh, when she was three years old. Uh, she went, once she outgrew it, uh, donated it to the, um, uh, the center. Very and nice. it's, very, it's, been, it's dear to me because every time I take my daughter in there, she remembers the dress. And so it, it's just uh, very touching. It, for me, it's... That's very makes it very personal. Oh yes, that's mm -hmm. right. What are uh, what are some of the programs that, uh, that for the research that the center uh, provides during the year? The students get those kind of organized. Yes, okay. it's primarily student uh, organized okay. uh, different events, uh, especially like uh, at the beginning of the school year, uh, Latino Heritage Month. Uh, trying to uh, they have a week long. Event, events uh, to promote Latino heritage uh, here on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, during the school year, different things. Uh, they bring in different speakers to talk about some of the different issues, like um, uh, as far as not children left behind, as far as uh, just sure. uh, immigration, uh, a lot of the uh, immig immigration issues to address some of those and be able to expose um, some of the student, uh, the, yeah, the students on campus to some of those issues. Um, at least to where they're aware of some of them. Right, yeah. Uh, what is, has the uh, people coming in, has it increased? No, unfortunately, and we've talked to the uh, provost, uh, uh, current provost, uh, Randy Woodson, about some of those things, because uh, the numbers have actually declined, and um, uh, at least from the indications, a lot of it has to do with the financial aspect of the uh, the amount of money or the amount of finances that the university is willing to make available to some of these students. So it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. So right, yeah, the, yeah, the numbers have, um, and it's the same issue with the uh, faculty. Um, we have uh, the retention has not been as good as what we'd liked it. Um, the, the numbers don't reflect, uh, you know, local or uh, national. And now they have a, a minor in Spanish Spanish studies, I believe, or something. Uh, Latino studies. Right. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's what I thought. And this is well. Important. Yes, and, and and again, that's another one of these. Um, uh, we were glad to see it happen, and uh, but I just found out there a couple of weeks ago that the professor that was going to lead that he has left, and so they're in the process of trying to find somebody else okay. to 
to, to, to um, carry it forward. To carry it forward and sure. move it forward. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about your family. Do you have uh, you have children then? They're, yes, I have okay. a daughter, nine year old, just nine years old right now, and so and that's the other uh, the other thing about the um, Latino Center that uh, is dear to me because, like I said, I would like for her to uh, as well uh, learn about her roots and her, her heritage and where um, so uh, that the center has been resourceful from that aspect of it and uh, as she's able to identify and so I hope that uh, as she gets older uh, she'll be able to uh, at least she has a place to if she wants to find out more about her heritage uh, she, she has, has a place, place to right. go right there were some joint things. You had some things with Ivy Tech, or there been some joint programs. Yes. Uh, Ivy Tech for the researchers is another school in the community, or college in the community. Yes. Uh, every year, um, the Ivy Tech uh, campus has a um, has an event, a uh, Latino event. Um, the, the most recently, and I was really, really glad to see this. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, as far as I know, it was a historical moment in the aspect that this is the first time a Mexican government or governor has come to the state of Indiana. They signed an accord to support education uh, in uh, Ivy, well, with the uh, was a sister city or the sister state in, um, in, in Mexico. Mexico. Oh, okay. So I was really glad that, uh, that I mean, that that happened, that happened here, uh, that we were part of it. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, being part of that, and right. that it's sort of an exchange program. Uh, I'm not really sure oh, to no, what extent. Yeah, okay. yeah, but uh, at, at the very least, to where yes, it's going to be an exchange. Uh, it'll provide a forum for the exchange of ideas uh, that will be beneficial for both uh, us here in the United States and for the uh, Mexican people in, uh, in Mexico. So. Since you've been in the community of the Latinos, has it increased? Are there more? Uh, yes. People? So the community has increased. Yes. The um, the or? population. Well, uh, one of the, uh, uh, was increasing. One of the things that's happening right now with the economy, um, the, I'm finding out that um, uh, from talking to different folks that has um, that a lot of them are going home with exportation. Um, the, of course, um, so it would be interesting. Uh, to see what happens here in the next couple of years because one of the the ongoing issues, one of the issues that has affected the growth uh, has been uh, legalization uh, and nothing has really happened on a national level to provide some of these folks with uh, some options. Uh, but um, I was just talking, uh, we were uh, some folks a couple of days ago, we were talking about as far as growth uh, in some of the other areas uh, and it was just amazing the explanation, exponential growth that has occurred um, in other areas. Uh, we've had some a lot of growth here as well, but not to the extent of some of these other areas that we've experienced. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, any particular? Uh, do you have any hobbies or special interests that you? No, I just you? like to travel. Uh, Got a special I, spot or? Or where are you off to next? <laughs> uh, wherever I can. <laughs> no, uh, my, my thing has always been uh, trying to understand cultures and uh, the difference um, that prevails within us, and uh, uh, trying to fi uh, trying to figure out how can we move closer to uh, being uh, being one. Because uh, I remember uh, going to Ireland, and uh, I was especially interested in Ireland uh, many years ago when I first started going out there. Matter of fact, I really enjoy. Uh, my trips to Ireland, but I was always thought it was interesting that here are we got people the same color, yet uh, why can't they get along? And come to find out that um, uh, that's been brewing for uh, as far as the differences uh, has been brewing on for hundreds of years. I still remember as far as uh, what museum I in um, Casual, the curator were talking about how back in the days of uh, King William. Um, there was nothing for the uh, the king uh, sent out his men and and massacre hundreds of uh, yeah. Irish. So and of course, a lot with the potato famine, everybody you know left and came to the states. It was a really big thing. They a lot of landed in Massachusetts. Yes, yeah, interesting though. Yeah. So that's always and that's my interest in it as far as the just understanding. Because I remember going to Australia. I was interested in to see how. Um, the Australian or how the Australians were dealing with their um, uh, 
race relationship uh, relationships and uh, they're not doing any better there than what we've done with ours out here uh, so and the same thing with uh, traveling in Europe um, and especially now with the economy uh, that uh, things are getting bad there as well so um, it seems to be the same well, it's just tight all around. You can, it's one of those things you're always working on. You yes. Know, working together and, and trying to smooth out some things, which but, takes a little bit of longer period of time than people think. But the thing that really got me on this uh, several years ago, I remember, as a matter of fact, it was at one of the uh, uh, one of the Latino functions, um, well, the um, the speaker, uh, and I'm trying to remember his name, he talked about, he was a... Uh, a senator from the Gary Lake County area, mm -hmm. Alvarado, I believe. I believe. Uh, but anyway, uh, he made a statement that I thought was rather profound and really got me thinking about this. Um, he said, you know, the greatest threat to humanity is not Amtrak's, it's not nuclear war, it's not terrorism. The greatest threat to uh, humanity is how we embrace diversity. Uh, if we can't uh, accept one another for who we are, that is what's going to do us in and not <laughs> all these other things. So Sure. The differences you have to overcome. Right. For the differences we sure. have to overcome because uh, he related some of the, uh, as far as uh, some of his stories, uh, sorry, uh, you know, from first coming to Lake County and how back then they were worried about what they were going to do with a handful of uh, Latino families. And now, you know, when you look at the, uh, the growth that has happened in these areas and no, it's nothing sure. compared to. Right. Yeah. And so that, uh, like I said, um, as a, the more I thought about what he's, he shared with us that day, the more I got to think. I said, yeah, we, I mean, if we're uh, going to improve our, the quality of our lives, that, that these are some of the issues uh, that, need that, we, at, that right? need to be looked at, need to be addressed. And that has, uh, you know, started me on um, what really got me interested in uh, trying to do whatever I can uh, to try to facilitate uh, those differences so sure. and so I enjoy working with uh, the students and why I keep uh, my initial involvement and why I keep involved with uh, students because there are indeed their future and if uh, we can plan plan those seats uh, with our students and hopefully where wherever they go they'll be and able they bring to an enrichment them. into the lives of, of everybody that's around you know mm -hmm. and it's really good any uh, any other comments that you'd care yes, to make? Yes, uh, because uh, the other the other piece uh, I, I shared as far as uh -huh. I remember uh, when I was working at John Deere, I went to a program uh, on uh, race issues, uh, race relationship, and I remember um, the facilitator there, um, and that was back in eighty three four, and uh, I remember back then. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, the guy Vivian, I can't remember what his. Uh, full name was, but anyway, um, he uh, he had walked uh, with Martin Luther King on some of the marches, and I asked him uh, at that time, I said, you know, uh, uh, so when are things going to get better as far as race relationships, or race relations go? And I said, never. And I said, no, it's got to be, people have got to see what it's doing to our society and I remember when I was sitting there listening to um, uh, the speaker I mentioned earlier, um, 25 some odd years later, and, go, and I was reflecting on uh, how things, uh, you know, what has changed, and it came to the re realization that uh, there really hasn't been that much change, and that unless we really get going here, or, you know, we're going to have another 25 years and another, you know, nothing. Really and didn't work uh, we we really have work together, right? That we really need to work and work together on some of these issues. Right. If we're ever going to leave, um, uh, yeah, make it better uh, and smooth things out and make it a lot easier. Right. Right. Yeah. So, any? Uh, you got? Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Usually, ask people that. Is any tradition of Purdue that comes to mind? You? No, that working <laughs> working <laughs> here. I'm glad just to get away. No. You and the, you and Boiler Rank repeat the um, the uh, Purdue engine or whatever. Uh, I want to thank you very much for this interview. I really appreciate this. It's very nice. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. you uh,